subcommittee will come to order. Today, the subcommittee is meeting to consider H.R. 4106, the Telework Improvement Act of 2007. So I now call up H.R. 4106, the Telework Improvements Act of 2007. And without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements. Um, ranking member Marchant and members of the subcommittee, good afternoon and welcome to the markup of H.R. 4106, the Telework Improvement Act of 2007 which improves access for federal employees to telework. The Office of Personnel Management defines telework as work arrangements in which an employee regularly performs officially assigned duties at home or at other work sites, geographically convenient to the residents of the employee. Telework continues to be underutilized by federal agencies and this bill provides for improvements that will allow more federal employees to participate in telework programs. Telework provides numerous benefits, including increased flexibilities for both employers and employees, continuity of operations during emergency events, and decreased energy use and air pollution. I'm pleased that Representative John Sarbanes, along with Chairman Henry Waxman, Congressman Tom Davis, Frank Wolf, Elijah Cummins, and Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton have co-sponsored the Telework Improvement Act of 2007. This legislation will bring together the efforts of my colleagues and break new ground by ensuring that eligible federal employees have the opportunity to telework and that agencies are incorporating telework into their continuity of operations planning. Many of the current federal programs were developed in response to a provision included in Appropriations Act of 2001, PL 10844, enacted in October of 2000. This law requires each executive branch agency to establish a telework policy under which eligible employees may participate in telecommuting to the maximum extent possible without diminishing employee performance. Under the current legislative framework, the General Services Administration, GSA, and OPM have leading roles in implementing government-wide telework initiatives. Unfortunately, telework is still not being used to the maximum extent it should be. According to a report released by OPM in December 2007 on telework, there are 110,592 employees teleworking in the federal government. This is a decrease from 119,248 in 2005. This is why H.R. 4106 is not only timely, but necessary. Um, this is, concludes my opening statement, but I also, at the appropriate time, will offer a manager's amendment in the nature of a substitute that takes into consideration the comments of my colleagues and will strengthen the bill. At this time, I'd like to ask if any other members have statements that they'd like to make. Representative Norton. Um, Mr. Chairman, I certainly want to thank you for bringing this um, bill forward. One begins to wonder how we got to the point where this was not authorized. I remember asking my own staff when there was a, we were in the minority, and there was a hearing here uh, I remember that Representative Frank, who has been a leader in the Appropriation Committee on this matter, came forward and testi testified, which raised my question in my mind, why is this happening? In the Appropriations Bill, and I was told something about, well, it's, you know, it's been going along uh, fine in the Appropriation Bill, but of course if something isn't authorized, uh, it depends upon annual appropriations, it doesn't get the kind of oversight that authorized bills do, and perhaps it doesn't spread. Indeed, I'm concerned, Mr. Chairman, to hear you say that the number of teleworkers has gone down. 
I, it's hard to understand that, particularly if that also applies to this this region. Um, given the problems we have now in overcrowded subways, um, not to mention traffic, one of the worst polluted areas in the country, baby boomers retiring at a huge rate, uh, model workforce hard to replace. Even in the District of Columbia where we have excellent um, public transportation, I'm sure there are many employees for whom telework would be responsible. So while I, I, I'm pleased that the Appropriation Committee uh, initiated this notion, I think you deserve great credit for putting it where it should be uh, as a, a authorized matter so that it can get the kind of attention so that we can make up for what has been responsible perhaps for the um, for the fall off and can help spread uh, telework. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Norton. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes, you have the list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to echo Congresswoman Norton and thanking you for uh, bringing this forward. Um, I, I took a stab at trying to get this in uh, from the energy side when the energy bill uh, was coming through last summer on the theory. Well, it's not a theory. It, it can be proven out quite easily that if you if you increase the amount of telework that's going on, you're going to reduce the carbon footprint of the federal government. Uh, we weren't able to get it through at that stage, and I appreciate your bringing it forward in the standalone uh, form, and I'm glad to co-sponsor it. Uh, this, this represents, I think telework represents the next uh, horizon, or maybe it's the next frontier is a better way to put it, in terms of creating more flexibility in the workplace. The first uh, major shift there had to do with the increase in part-time opportunities. Uh, when I was in the, in the private sector in, in the law firm, that was, that was beginning to become more of the norm and the rationale for it from the employer side was that if you didn't offer better part-time arrangements, you were going to leave a tremendous um, workforce out there on the table that you weren't going to have access to, talented, bright people who were looking for more flexibility uh, in the workplace. This is another stage of that. And I think uh, what's most exciting about it is the opportunity to be able to recruit very talented people and keep them in government service at a time when all the statistics are showing that we're going to have hundreds of thousands of even what they call mission critical jobs becoming vacant over the next few years. And so anything we can do to pull people in, and I think telework as an example of something that can do that. Um, so creating more formal policies, having people in each agency that have the responsibility for for exploring and facilitating this telework option for employees is absolutely critical. Uh, one of the criticisms that's leveled or, or sort of the warnings that's offered up as to why we should be, uh, you know, all too careful about heading down this telework road is that it would uh, negatively impact accountability and productivity. And on that point, I just wanted, there's a quote from Ronald Compton, who's the former CEO of Aetna Life and Casualty. And this is what he said, talking about competing in the private sector. He said, what I would say to a CEO who resists greater employee flexibility, uh, such as teleworking, because of concerns about loss of accountability and productivity, I'd hope he was a competitor and I'd keep my mouth shut companies that don't believe in this are going to be trapped by it in the end. Well, there's no reason why the federal government should be trapped by this in the end, so we need to get out on the cutting edge so we can compete for these very talented workers out there that are looking for this option. So I'm excited to be a, uh, a co-sponsor of this, and thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sarbanes. Um, I ask unanimous consent that members' written statements be included in the record, and without objection, so is ordered. I now open H.R. 4106 for consideration, and without objection, the reading of the bill will be dispensed with. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point.
At this time, I'd like to offer a manager's amendment to H.R. 4106. After consulting with the minority and other stakeholders, I've made several changes to the underlying bill. These changes include allowing an agency to temporarily restrict an employee from teleworking in the event of an emergency, requiring GSA to maintain a central telework website, allowing GSA to waive the bill's requirements that a TMO be at least a GS 15R equivalent, limiting GAO's annual reporting requirement to 10 years, and ensuring that the definition of telework covers all authorized activities that can be performed from an alternate work site. These changes address the concerns of my colleagues, strengthen the bill, and ensure proper oversight and implementation of the government's telework programs. Um, will the clerk uh, read the amendment? Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4106, offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois. Strike all after the enacting clause and the insert the following. We will, the amendment will be considered as read. Uh, we now uh, open and have a vote on the Davis Amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion is agreed to. And H.R. 4106, are there any other amendments? I'll now move that the subcommittee on the Federal Workforce Postal Service in the District of Columbia Report H.R. 4106 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendation that the bill does pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 4106 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And H.R. 4106 is audit reported to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. I want to thank um, all of the members, especially given the fact that um, today is Thursday and we have finished our legislative business for the week, which means that many members have taken the opportunity to return home to their districts as quickly as they can except those who live in places like Chicago where the weather will keep you out and <laughs> suggest that you stay as far away as you can. <laughs> but I certainly want to thank all of the members for attending. And if there are any other comments, we would entertain those at the moment. If not, then uh, we, by unanimous consent, will adjourn this meeting. Without objection, the meeting stands adjourned.
subcommittee will come to order. Welcome to all of the members of the subcommittee here and witnesses and all of those in attendance. Welcome to the Federal Workforce Postal Service and the District of Columbia subcommittee hearing on the implementation of the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act of 2006. The purpose of this hearing is to examine how the U.S. Postal Service, the Postal Board of Governors, and the Postal Regulatory Commission are implementing the act and its impact on the postal community. Here, no objection, the chair, ranking member, and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Um, ranking member Marchant, members of the subcommittee, and hearing witnesses. Welcome to the subcommittee's hearing on the implementation of the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act of 2006. Today's hearing will examine the progress of the United States Postal Service and the Postal Regulatory Commission in the implementation of the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act of 2006. The Postal Service performs a valuable national service. In 2007, it delivered over 212 billion pieces of mail to nearly 148 million delivery points. Over $80 billion was spent in providing these and other postal services, required as part of meeting the Postal Service's universal mandate. To ensure the financial soundness of the service and its primary function of mail delivery, the Congress passed the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act of 2006. The act making it the first major piece of postal reform legislation since the one that created the Postal Service in 1970. The act was a direct result of the postal community coming together and reaching agreement on work sharing, rate setting, price and flexibility, diversity, and a number of other provisions to ensure that the Postal Service can compete in today's marketplace. It is only through an economically vibrant postal service, one that can respond rapidly and effectively to change in marketing conditions, that we can preserve the important American ideal of universal service. To ensure compliance with the act, the subcommittee has conducted and will continue to conduct aggressive postal oversight and in particular monitor the implementation of the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act of 2006. Today I look forward to hearing about the progress of the Postal Service and the Postal Regulatory Commission have made in implementing the changes mandated in the act. We have already seen evidence of progress. For example, the Postal Regulatory Commission developed and in issued final regulations for a new rate-making system on October 29, 2007, nearly eight months before the statutory deadline of June 20, 2008, set forth by the Act. And on February 11, 2008, the Postal Regulatory Commission filed for its first ever rate adjustment for market dominant products under the new regulations when they announced that the price of a first class stamp will increase by one cent, effective May 12, 2008. I thank you and look forward to hearing testimony from today's witnesses. Um, we will now uh, hear testimony from the witnesses before us. And uh, the witness for panel one is uh, not here at the moment. Then we will proceed to the witness for panel two. All right. 
truth here. Our witness for panel one is prof Professor Frank A. Wallach. He is a professor of economics at Stanford University. His fields of research are industrial organization and empirical economic analysis. Dr. Wolak specializes in the study of privatization, competition, and regulation in network industries such as electricity, telecommunications, water supply, natural gas, and postal delivery services. He assisted the Postal Rate Commission with numerous rate cases and regulatory issues for more than 10 years and has written numerous academic articles on postal economics. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wolak. And as is customary, witnesses before this committee uh, uh, are sworn in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand, you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Record will show that the witness answered in the affirmative. Again, let me thank you so much and uh, we will proceed. Uh, your entire statement will be included in the record. Uh, we'd like for you to take five minutes and summarize that. Of course, we have a timer and when things get yellow, it means that you're down to four minutes and then as they turn red, we'd like for you to kind of wrap up and thank you so much. So a modern system of regulation at attempts to balance two competing goals, strong incentives for the firm to produce in a least cost manner and to protect consumers from prices uh, for market dominant products that reflect the market power of the monopoly provider. And the price cap mechanism is, is one such approach uh, that is attempting to achieve both of these goals. And, um, this is certainly a, a, is a one, one of the things and is a part of the process, but I believe that a, a major role that uh, can really make this uh, uh, process work even better is if the Postal Regulatory Commission fully exploits its information gathering powers under the Act to attain the best possible data uh, from the Postal Service that's appropriate for its needs and uses this data to analyze postal operations, compute accurate product level cost estimates, construct service quality indices, and all of these can significantly increase the likelihood that the act will actually achieve the goals of maintaining higher service quality levels and setting economically efficient pricing. Another role for the uh, commission under the act is to quantify the cost of the universal service obligation. And this is a uh, conceptually challenging task that requires infinite imp intimate knowledge of postal service operations and once again the ability of the postal rate commission to regulatory commission excuse me to gather data to analyze cost is an important aspect of determining uh, the universal service obligation uh, and to make sure that informed decisions can be made about what it should look like and how it should uh, adapt to the changing competitive conditions that the postal service faces um, I'd now like to just discuss a bit in terms of the the role of the information provision. What, what information provision can really do in a regulatory process is provide what I'd like to call smart sunshine regulation. And by this I mean uh, the collection of data and analysis uh, in a manner and release to the public in a manner that really helps parties to on, ongoing, on an ongoing basis monitor the performance of the Postal Service over time as well as across processing locations to improve the effectiveness of the postal regulatory process and the effectiveness of postal service operations. Um, another area where this uh, ability to gather data can be particularly important is that in previous rate cases, uh, the Postal uh, Rate Commission in its previous incarnation has identified significant errors in data used by the Postal Service in a number of their mail processing studies. 
Uh, and if the Postal Regulatory Commission is able to request data that it needs and ensure that it is suitable for the task, it can theref therefore improve the process of, of cost studies as well as improve the accuracy of pricing and other sorts of things. A final but important benefit of the Commission's regulatory authority is just simply uh, monitoring the overall monitoring of the health of the Postal Service uh, similar to a doctor taking a patient's temperature, pulse, and blood pressure and other measures of health status. And in the same way that a patient's vital signs are used by a doctor to diagnose an illness and recommend a remedy, uh, changes in these performance, a consistent set of performance measures collected over time uh, can be used by the Postal Regulatory Commission in the same way that the doctor uses these vital signs to diagnose problems to be proactive in, in, in recommending any sort of cures for problems discovered before they develop into uh, significant problems. The, the final point that I would like to discuss is the, is the question of the need for a proactive uh, data collection and analysis rather than a retroactive. And in particular, the Act calls for the uh, uh, Postal Service to notify the Commission of any intention to raise rates. Uh, and, in, 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 and allows for a retrospective uh, a review of these rates if the Postal Regulatory Commission receives comments uh, from the party on these rates. Um, the difficulty is, is that the timing of this process is such that the, the, by the time the process actually occurs and, and the, and the uh, rates are reviewed, it would be extremely difficult to uh, actually implement the rates that are finally reviewed in time for the next submission by the Postal uh, Service for a, 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 a rate increase in a future period. So this really emphasizes the importance of a proactive uh, process of collecting data, analyzing data, being ready and immediately available to act in response to a Postal Service uh, uh, rate uh, proposal uh, with the state-of-the-art cost estimates. So in conclusion, I, I just would like to say that I think the Postal Accountability Act can really uh, achieve the goals that it's intended, but an important part of achieving those goals is the authority of, of the Postal Regulatory Commission to obtain the best possible information and use this in a proactive manner uh, to inform both its process as well as the public uh, debate over the future of the Postal Service. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wolak. Um, again, let me thank you for coming and for being here. Um, as you know, uh, total mail volume is declining. That is both first class and standard mail. Um, my question is, is this. Do you think that these trends are going to continue? And if they are, is there anything that the Postal Service can do or can you think of the Postal Service doing anything that might turn these trends around? Uh, well, I, th I think it's, uh, there, there are certainly, in my own research, uh, I've, I've uh, ad identified uh, trends in the, certainly the decline in the household demand for postal delivery services. Uh, and it certainly seems that on the business side with people uh, doing, receiving their bills online as well as paying online, this is certainly going to lead to a business decline. But I think the, the opportunity that the, um, the Act really uh, allows is the ability of the Postal Service to, if you like, use its pricing flexibility to maximize the amount of revenue it can receive from a given class of mail by the flexibility that it has to alter the prices. So, um, so this would call say that you know gets back to again the issue of data collection. Of it, it, it would be useful for the postal service to really get a much better idea of what the structure of its demand looks like, as well as what the structure of the costs it looks like. Because typically, firms in the in the you know private sector, competitive sector, the way that you maximize their the contribution to fixed costs that you achieve is by knowing the variable cost of each product that you sell and understanding the structure of demand for your product. So I think there's a, there, is a, uh, that there is a role for much greater uh, data collection and value of data collection analysis also by the Postal Service as a way to, to if you like, make the most for the volume uh, that it actually serves. Uh, the, you know, sort of the decline in volume is in some ways, I think, a, s a function of the uh, 
changing nature of, of the way that we communicate, and it's sort of not something we can do a whole lot about. <laughs> well, let me ask you, uh, as an expert in regulating the energy and telecommunications industries, um, what lessons have been learned there that might be applicable or applied to trying to regulate as effectively as possible the postal industry? Well, I think that, that was the major theme of my testimony is to really try to bring those lessons and the important lesson that I, I've learned from certainly my experience with electricity is uh, you know, get, get the data out there, allow people to analyze it, to understand it. Uh, you know, many eyes looking at information, looking at how things are working uh, can provide far better uh, regulatory oversight uh, than, than a very insular and closed process. Uh, and the other is I think it, that getting the information out there can help to make some pretty politically uh, difficult decisions to move forward to uh, make the you know, Postal Service financially viable into the future by, by informing the process with good analysis. I guess the, the way that I would characterize it is, is having the data uh, and performing analysis constrains the amount that people can theorize without any basis and therefore reduces the amount of uh, if you like, uh, uh, you know, talk, idle talk and, and focuses in on what really is the, the sort of the trade-offs that must be faced in, in moving forward because you can say this bit of analysis rules out that as a possible explanation. Let's, let's really get down to what is consistent with the work that we've done. So I think it's really the uh, quantitative, gathering the data, analyzing the data and, 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 and you know, putting it into the public uh, discussion is I think very useful. Accurately forecasting or, or trying to know and project what the volume of mail is going to be is obviously essential to the Postal Service uh, in order for it to plan well. Um, how well do you think the Postal Service is doing in both its short-term planning as well as long-term? That's, uh, <laughs> I think it's, a, it's an extremely uh, difficult uh, task. Uh, I guess the, 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 the thing that I would I emphasize is that it may be worth spending some money to engage in what most businesses do, which is essentially marketing research in the sense of uh, who are my customers, how much they spend, why do they spend what they spend, and you know, analyzing you know, th that, that kind of information I, I know that the Postal uh, Service collects the what's called Consumer Diary Survey, which is a, a, a diary of uh, essentially households, uh, but there's uh, not as, uh, I as, as a similar survey for the business sector, which is certainly, I think, a very rapidly changing sector in terms of the types of postal products that it's using. And so having, you know, say an ongoing, say, probability sample of, of, uh, of those sorts of customers to understand why they're moving where they're moving, I think can really help the Postal Service get a much better handle on uh, where, uh, where their volume is going. I, I think you know, currently, I, th I guess what I'd say is, given the data that they do collect, I, I'd say they do a, a very good job, but I think getting a bit more into uh, you know, customer level surveys that are representative of the class of customers that you face and truly trying to understand the trends for specific customers and drivers for specific customers, I think can really help to improve those, those sorts of forecasts. Almost every month, it appears as though there is some additional electronic um, diversion or possibility relative to technology just simply um, burgeoning and, and it seems unlimited. Um, do you have any forecasts or projections as to whether or not we're going to continue to see an increase in electronic communications or is there going to be uh, any leveling off so that we might uh, continue to have the same level of need that exists for the mail delivery that we see coming from the Postal Service? Well, certainly in the, some of the, the work that I've done, the, um, at least for the household sector, which is all I've 
manage, have the data for. I'm hoping the Postal Service will collect for the business sector to analyze that. But uh, for the for the household sector, it, it certainly seems that the the good news is is everybody has high speed internet access, uh, and essentially there therefore is a sort of leveling off in terms of the impact of the growing penetration of electronic communication. Uh, the the the, the uh, uh, so, so in that sense, I think it's it's uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's it is there is evidence at least for that that it's that it's leveling off. If you like, the sort of the major, it seems, electronic diversion from the household sector occurred probably about uh, when the internet was really was really ramping up. But now, almost everyone who is uh, uh, using the internet is using the internet. And the un but the unfortunate thing is that the sort of intensive users of the Postal Service and probably the most inelastic commanders of the Postal Service at the household level are certainly, unfortunately, the older people. <laughs> and they're, they're sort of, they're going away. <laughs> uh, and the, 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 the more less intensive users and more flexible users are, are, are growing. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a, another factor that I think is unfortunately uh, contributing. Thank you very much. Um. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as you may remember, I'm fascinated by this model that, at least in this country, is, that I see is unique. And, <laughs> and um, I appreciate very much Mr. Wallach's testimony, and particularly the way it began by looking at how private uh, sector firms uh, would operate and then moving on to where tools might, uh, be, uh, might help the Postal Service. I'm really, particularly after sitting through hearings uh, and being struck by conundrum after conundrum <laughs> in what is being required of the Postal Service, I begin to wonder about this model itself. <laughs> I noticed you talked about vital signs. Well, you know, vital signs which assume that the organs that are in this body belong in this body and are supposed to work together. And so, you know, you, you get sick and you, you put some medicine in and they begin to work like they're supposed to work. But what you've got here is a, a model with caps on it and th that's appropriate because the Postal Service still performs a public function. It has to deliver and, and uh, deal with mail in the far corners where you wouldn't expect the private sector to, to earn a profit. Um, on the other hand, we have said, but you're supposed to act like a private sector co company, you know. Make some money, take care of yourself. Um, and I you indicate that they're certainly gonna have a, a hard time doing that if they don't have something close to perfect data. Um, and that they'd have to get that data in a fairly refined way uh, using technology and almost a quick, quick response or proactive way. Um, well, I, my, my question is given the coexistence of a private sector and a public sector model in the same body. Uh, suppose you did have perfect data And you were dealing only with where, I think you call them non-cap issues, non-cap issues, you know, like express mail, I guess priority mail, they're not a, a lot of those. And there's heavy competition from the private sector, which consists often wholly of that kind of mail. I mean, uh, very pleased that the post office has been able to break into it at all. But of course, part of it is by the same way anybody would operate in the private sector, to underpricing them, trying to improve uh, on it. You know, even for commercial magazines, uh, they are, are, are capped uh, in terms of what you can charge. I mean, the, the magazines that themselves earn a lot of money. Uh, leave aside nonprofits. I'm talking about the Time magazines and whoever it is that uses the mail. But of course, you have to do that because otherwise they'll move someplace else <laughs> in order to send their magazines out. I, I, I just have to ask you, and, and you know, let's let's assume that we get some perfect data. How cl how close will that come to solving this uh, conundrum? 
um, so that perfect data, I mean, that's my model, I'm assuming it, I recognize how difficult it is, uh, will somehow make it easier for them to set, to do pricing according to the market. Of course, pricing according to the market brings other problems with it, um, like competing in the market. And whether you know of any model in the world where the public and private uh, components are combined that we might look more closely uh, at. And finally, just let me give the model, you know, we try to push private sector pricing into models that every, any fool would know they uh, won't work. For example, in the post office has done better than Amtrak. The private sector turns over Amtrak to the federal government in 1971 and said, we surely can't deal with this. You know, this doesn't fit our pricing model. We go out of business. Here, government, you take it. And this administration has tried to treat Amtrak as if it were once again, you know, like any private railroad, except if you look at the world at large, there is no such thing as a railroad which is not subsidized heavily by its government. And so you have all kinds of extraordinary rail travel throughout Europe and Asia. And we're sitting here with Amtrak not, not having enough money even to take care of its security problems. So, uh, so, my, so my question goes, you know, do, do we have any model to work from if we had perfect data? How much or do you think this would solve the problem given the non-cap, small, maybe 10% of the business is non-cap? That, that has to compete with highly competitive, highly efficient international corporations that do, that do business all over the world. Um, I, I'd just like to hear you just opine on uh, this issue or whether we're about to drive the post office into the ground the way we have Amtrak. Well, uh, I, I think what you're really referring to <coughs> at least uh, I'll recast it as that it's really the USO obligate, universal service obligation is, I would classify that as sort of the government uh, aspect and then the private. And I think that is really a major issue going forward for the Postal Service and the Postal Regulatory Commission. And even in a world with perfect data, there are, as I note in my testimony, some really difficult and uh, conceptual issues in terms of thinking about is, you know, is I think your point exactly of uh, many of the rail lines that exist in Europe exist purely, I think, for USO reasons in the sense that there is a desire of the government to say we should provide transportation, even if it's uneconomic, to these areas because we think there is a, you know, public benefit aspect to it. And that's the essential feature of the universal service obligation is we define an obligation that really doesn't make economic sense, but it makes the, you know, greater sense in the, in the, in the greater good sense. And um, that really is, is the, the, the issue and th th that exists, I think, to, to a lesser extent in other network industries and at least to my mind makes them very interesting. In the telecom sector, we have the universal service obligation that we want to provide everyone with access to telephone service, but trouble is telephone service has become so cheap that it's not nearly as hard to do that and it's, you know, people and similarly with electricity. But um, uh, we have a, 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 you know, to provide universal access to people. Uh, the Postal Service presents a more challenging, you know, universal service obligation just because of how it has been defined as I put a stamp on that letter and that stamp delivers it to anywhere in the, in, in the United States uh, and, you know, regardless if it's across the street or, or in the Grand Canyon uh, and, and, you know, that is, you know, that's a, that's a very challenging process that makes the determination of that. But I if you like, you, you give me the ideal data, I'll give you the ideal outcome. The ideal outcome is we take that ideal data and we figure out what that cost is and we recover that cost uh, to make sure that the universal service obligation is met and then we then say, okay, postal service subject to just the fact that you have to make some contribution to fixed costs from the competitive products, we give you complete flexibility in, you know, in how you price those to, to compete against the vigorous competition that you face. But the, it is a, I definitely think a very major challenge to, to figure out first just what is that universal service obligation and then second is what is the cost of it and I think that's a, a very uh, important discussion that needs to take place given that 
you know, the, 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 the discussion that I had with the, the chairman of, of the changing role of interpersonal communications that results from the fact that we have the internet and these sorts of things, so we may want to revisit what, what the USO obligation really is. But that's something for yeah, not, Mr. not Chair, for today. I, I just don't think there's any chance we're going to revisit that obligation. <laughs> the one thing that happens in this place when you talk about uh, revisiting that obligation is that you get the one issue that gets you a universal vote with no dissents. Uh, so <laughs> so that's the conundrum of which I speak. And I, I just think we have to re re reinvent the model. I must say this whole notion of flexibility, price, there is no such thing as price flexibility. Private sector has no flexibility. You know, it is, it is more discipline. Uh, it is, it, you might not call it a cap, but if it wants to stay in business, you gotta compete with other people who want to do the business more efficiently and at less cost. They have very little flexibility, and so they do it by, <laughs> they do it uh, in, all, in all manner of ways, and so they, we gave them the quote, same flexibility, you know, here's your flexibility, go and compete with, you know, um, Express Mail, or <laughs> you, uh, go and, and compete with the people who invented uh, this, uh, uh, a whole new way of doing what you do. Um, on management, um, the, uh, the Postal Service itself, of course, is unionized. We approve of that. Um, management uh, in the Postal Service um, is, is uh, I'm not sure what the nature of the regulation there is, but these, these are people who operate as managers. There would, might be some problems with, with pay for performance, although I understand they do some of that. But is there, uh, uh, but in terms of efficiency or good, good managers, um, is there any reason to believe that the Postal Service couldn't attract the, the, the same kind of managers that Federal Express or some of those people attract? What would keep them from getting those managers where there may be more flexibility than in a, a unionized workforce? Well, um, it, <laughs> it, it, the, it, the, there certainly is gr far greater flexibility to pay for performance in the, in the private sector than in, in the Postal Service, and um, that, that, that certainly, I think, has, has you know, both positive and negatives. Um, yeah, well, we, we, we've seen the negatives, yeah. and that's not what this committee, but, 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 but again, is that what, is the, is, the, is the kind of management we have in the Postal Service that much different from the management of similar uh, non-cap uh, non services uh, provided in the private sector? Well, I certainly think you, your, your, your point of the, uh, certainly one way that a number of the other firms perhaps are less encumbered is, is, the, is the degree of unionization, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to comment anything on that, so that can make it more difficult for but you see, I, really, I, that, that, I don't really think that's our problem. What happened was Federal Express <laughs> invented a whole new way of rapidly, rapidly dealing with the mail. Yes, they're not unionized, you know, but in order to remain competitive uh, with the Postal Service, for that matter, they've got to pay very well. The way in which you, the, the challenge for the Postal Service is a challenge not unlike the challenge that American Express had. Okay, do invent a model, a new model that fits this universe. The universe they found was a universe in which there was not express mail, in which you couldn't do things overnight, in which you couldn't ship, ship things that were perishable quickly. So they invented a model that fit them. What I'm suggesting is model <laughs> is a jerry-built model that oh, no, no, seems no, no, to no. satisfy neither side. Witnesses, the moment we want to change the universal model, people scream, and <laughs> obviously doesn't satisfy the, the competitive side because they're competing with people for who, who they must underprice or, or become vastly more efficient than <laughs> in order to even stay in the game. So I don't even see these two as coexisting in the same universe. I, I, I guess I would say the, the is, is, is someone who has visited a, a number of uh, postal sorting facilities. I mean, they are they're very 
modern operations have state-of-the-art equipment. They're very, uh, I, I think, the, you know, using you know, monitor management practices to as, as much as possible. But I guess the, you know, the, what, I, what I would say is, is that there's, there's, there's um, you know, the simple way to describe it, I think, would be is there's looking at things in terms of how much labor do I put in, how many pieces do I get sorted. But when you're operating in a market context, it's, it's more of uh, how many dollars of labor or how many dollars do I spend on this, how much therefore sales do I get at the other end, and how much therefore contribution am I, am I getting to pay for my fixed costs. Uh, and it's sort of a, 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 a in the market environment, that's, that's, that's really what you're interested in. So even if, suppose, it's very costly for you to do something, if what you're able to sell it for is something you know, very high, that, that that's something that in a market environment you're going to do, which is, and I think that's the transition that's taking place under the act and is hopefully uh, being, uh, you know, it taking place, is, is a recognition of you are competing in the marketplace, that it really is how are you getting contribution to fixed cost rather than just simply improving the efficiency of postal operations in the sense of, you know, amount of labor hours, amount of pieces sorted. And, and, you know, if the pieces you're sorting aren't the ones and doing a very good job of sorting aren't the ones that are really high value to you uh, and you're probably not as good at sorting the ones that are extremely high value to you, then you probably want to get more of those. And, and, and that's, I think, the, 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 the new model. And, and, and I think that, that that's where, you know, understanding how you're making your money is really the the change in the world, and that's just not something in a monopoly environment that you really need to be concerned with because the monopoly environment guarantees you uh, essentially cost recovery, whereas the competitive environment uh, doesn't. <laughs> and so you really have to be much more cognizant of, of, of that. And the price cap mechanism in some sense is trying to say, look, you have really no ability to move your prices. They will simply increase at this CPI. So you know, try your best to, to figure out the best place to try to sell your products to, you know, scale down your operations to do that. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, Mr. Morlock. I, be, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that this perfect data <laughs> might well tell the Postal Service to raise, <laughs> raise prices in the non-capped area. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to deal with their revenue problems, which are immense, and look what that would mean in competing with Federal Express and the rest of them. That's why I think this is a, this is a, we need a wholly new model. And I accept the private sector model, and I accept the universal service model, and I don't know what to do about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Norton. Um, thank you, Mr. Warwick. Thank you. Um, we appreciate your coming and your testimony. <laughs> we will now move to panel two. Ms. Catherine Cigarette is a director in the Physical Infrastructure Issues Team at the Government Accountability Office, GAO. She has directed GAO's work on postal issues for several years, including recent reports on delivery standards and performance, process and network realignment, <coughs> contracts and policies, semi-postal stamps, and biological threats. Thank you very much, Ms. Cigarette, and it's <coughs> our custom to swear in our witnesses. If you would raise your right hand and you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The record will indicate that the witness answered in the <coughs> affirmative. We thank you very much for coming and for being here. Um, your Full statement is in the record. If you would take five minutes and summarize for us, we'd appreciate that. And thank you very much. Chairman Davis, Ms. Norton, members of the subcommittee, thank you for your invitation to testify at today's hearing concerning the implementation of the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. When I testified about a year ago before this subcommittee, I said that the Congress's efforts to pass comprehensive postal reform provided opportunities to address many of the Postal Service's challenges. We are now at the point where we can begin to assess the Act's implementation. Today I will focus on, first, actions to date resulting from the Act, including how they affected the Service's 2007 financial condition, and, second, continuing challenges and areas for oversight. My full statement also covers how studies required under the law can contribute to future postal reform decisions. 
My statement today is often a positive one, as we are encouraged by the early steps that the service, the PRC, mailers, and the stakeholders have taken. They have found new ways to engage in constructive dialogue and in several cases reach consensus on how best to proceed. These actions, which contrast sharply with the former adversarial rate making process, hold promise for future progress across a broad range of postal reform issues. Such collaboration and progress will remain necessary as the service and the mailing industry transform themselves in response to the rapidly changing marketplace and continue to implement these reforms. Turning now to implementation of the Act, the service, the PRC, and other postal stakeholders have worked cooperatively to, to date to meet their responsibilities in fulfilling its requirements. Key actions include establishing, first, early regulations for a new rate setting system, which influence the service's decision to pursue its proposed rate increase under the new system. Second, a mechanism that requires pre-funding of retiree health insurance premiums, thus distributing this burden between current and future rate payers, and third, modern service standards for the services products covered by the postal monopoly. These were, these were the result of a collaborative effort and were the most sweeping update in years. In addition, several reports required under the Act have been issued and the PRC has solicited comments and held meetings to stimulate dialogue on the complex issues related to the re new regulatory framework. In terms of impact, the service reported a $5.1 billion net loss for 2007. Other aspects of the Act, such as retiree health obligations, directly affected these results. So did factors such as recent rate increases and costs such as wages, fuel, and adding 1.8 million new delivery points. This left the service with a total debt of $4.2 billion. With regard to challenges and areas for oversight, we have in the past called attention to basic challenges facing the services, such as changing mail volumes and increasing delivery points, and these remain relevant today. They are exacerbated by our current economic environment. A slowing economy, recent rate increases, and other factors negatively affected the, fi the service's financial performance in the first quarter of 2008. Its mail volumes and revenues, particularly the key products of first class and standard mail, were lower than planned. The service was able to respond by cutting costs. Although the service anticipates additional revenues from its proposed rate increase, additional cost reductions beyond those that had been planned will be ne needed to meet its financial projections for 2008. We have also followed the service's challenges in improving its efficiency. This includes realigning its processing and other infrastructure. The Act requires the service to develop a plan by June for rationalizing its network and removing excess processing capacity. This provides the service the opportunity to make its case for continued action and address concerns and recommendations raised by the PRC, the Postal IG, and GAO. The service also plans several new technology investments that have the potential to increase efficiency, such as a system to sort flat-shaped mail and the transition to the intelligent mail barcode. There is also the significant challenge of measuring and reporting on the quality of service for most postal products. The Postal Service must, in consultation with the PRC, submit a plan to Congress by June for how it will meet its newly established standards, including performance goals. It must then begin to report on performance. The service and its stakeholders have made good progress to date, and our work suggests that, with regard to reporting, key principles of completeness, availability, and usefulness should guide future actions, and that this should continue to be a collaborative effort. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, given these challenges, key areas for continued oversight include how mailers and mail volume have and will respond to rate changes, the effects of changes in mail volume and revenue on the service's financial condition, efforts to control costs by modernizing and optimizing the Postal Service's infrastructure and workforce, the transition to new automation and mail tracking systems, and the level of transparency and measuring and reporting on delivery performance. This completes my statement. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sigarek. Um, let me ask you, how well would you say or what is your impression of how well the Postal Service and the Postal Regulatory Commission have been implementing uh, the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act? Mr. Chairman, as I think you can tell from my statement, we, we have a generally good outlook on those issues. Just a couple of examples. Um, Developing these new regulations was very complex, uh, particularly with regard to rate setting uh, and the efforts that were done to modernize uh, the service standard. Both of those were carried out in a collaborative and open fashion. 
And in the case of the rate uh, setting framework, of course, the deadline was uh, met ahead of time, allowing the Postal Service to have a new uh, rate proposal under the new system. Um, the key deadlines have been met not only by the Postal Service and the PRC, but by uh, several other key stakeholders that were also required to report to the Congress uh, in the last year. Um, we think there are a couple areas for oversight that I mentioned in my statement, including with regard to looking at mail volumes and revenues, and clearly this current economic situation that we're in uh, will be a, a concern going forward over this coming year. We continue to hear rumbles of economic slowdown, recession, some places depression, shaky outlook for the economic future. Um, how well would you say that the Postal Service is positioned to handle a, a slowdown or, or, or a downturn in terms of the movement of, of communication devices? Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, I think it's worth thinking about that question in both sort of a long and a short term point of view. Um, from the short term point of view, clearly the Postal Service is suffering from lower than expected volumes. This is a direct result of problems in the financial services sector and other sectors that are related to housing and credit. It's really impossible to know how long this will last. However, volumes are also affected by two other longer term issues. Uh, one being, of course, we just talked uh, with the, the previous witness about the electronic diversion issue. Um, there's also the effects of last summer's rate increase in which the Postal Service gave incentives to mailers to prepare mail in a way that was cost effective for the Postal Service. Mailers are responding by changing the nature and the volume of, of, their, of their mailings. The Postal Service also faces some significant cost issues. Fuel prices come to mind. Uh, based on recent news and, and the, uh, the data from last year for the Postal Service. Um, there are also colas for employees that must be made under the collective bargaining agreements. Um, short term, the Postal Service will be able to reduce its work hours since they are partly driven by volume, but that is not going to be a successful long term strategy in terms of responding to volume decreases. Um, the good news is that um, in the first quarter of this year, we began to see these issues happen. Uh, the Postal Service um, was able to cut costs, reduce work hours, and uh, also provide record service in the portion of the first class mail that it measures and reports. So there are both short term solutions, long term solutions. Short term solutions involve work hours, uh, looking at, at overtime, looking at transportation costs, as well as the fact that there will be uh, new revenue in May when the new uh, rate comes, comes uh, into being. Long term, what the Postal Service needs to do is really use the flexibility uh, given to it in the act to develop and refine its products and services to attract increased volume and revenue. Uh, it also needs to improve productivity and efficiency. Uh, the flat sorting machines that are coming into place have some promise in that area. The data that will come out of the implementation of the intelligent mail barcode should also help the Postal Service to improve its management. And finally, it does have the opportunity to try to remove some excess capacity from its networks in the long run. And so you think that there is room for increased uh, proficiency? And, and, and yeah, absolutely, and I'm sure the Postmaster General would agree with me on that issue. Um, and that is part of the reason the Postal Service is going, for example, with investments in, in automation. Thank you very much. Um, Representative Moore. Thank you very much for this testimony. Could I ask you how you think, uh, you, you, you say in your testimony, uh, that the, the ongoing economic problems of the Postal Service are uh, exacerbated by, you say, a uh, projected $600 million net loss for 2008. How do you expect the Postal Service to meet the problems uh, caused by this loss or to carry this loss? Uh, well, the Postal Service did project a loss, so this is, is not a surprise to anyone. Uh, the uh, economic situation may, may make the, the situation worse. Uh, the Postal Service does have a variety of short-term cost-cutting efforts that may help to deal with that. The Postal Service is also allowed to borrow money, and it, in fact, it, it will be increasing its debt at the end of the year as well. But going back to my response to the Chairman, I think um, the, the using the flexibility in the Increase act. Increase its debt? Yes. 
in, in, in order to, what kind of bond rating does it have? I do not know the, the bond rating on that, Ms. Norton. Uh, the Postal Service does have a, a cap on the total amount of debt that it can carry as well as the amount it can accrue each year. What are you saying, increasing debt in, in order to deal with loss? Uh, it subject? also is using debt to uh, make capital investments. Yeah, but so it just carries the loss over from year to year. How much, uh, is, is this, this an, these losses annual? Have they been of this magnitude for some years now? Uh, the, the losses actually are largely due at this point to the fact that the Postal Service is complying with the Postal Accountability and, and Enhancement Act requirement to pay into retiree health benefit funds. Uh, that will continue to be true for nine years, either eight or nine years following this year. That will continue to be a heavy lift for the Postal Service. It does have plans, however, to try to continue to grow revenue and uh, reduce costs in order to deal with that situation. Uh, you mentioned um, an, an obvious and terrible problem that any business like the post office has, and that is dealing with fuel costs. Right. Uh, is the Postal Service, uh, as it purchases new vehicles, which it must have to do very often, converting to hybrid vehicles, vehicles or the like? This is an interesting question. We did some work uh, on this very question last year and reported out in, in February. Uh, the Postal Service has a number of different approaches to try to save fuel, but with regard to the vehicles, um, under the previous Energy Act, it was uh, required to primarily purchase alternative fuel or flex fuel vehicles. My understanding is that under newer legislation, the Postal Service is able to go in the direction of, hi of uh, purchasing hybrids, which it expects to have a better payoff in terms of fuel efficiency. What alternative fuel, what kinds of uh, uh, biofuel? Well, and the flex fuel vehicles, of course, typically run on ethanol when they, uh, when they are not running on gasoline. But it was, so you're saying that, um, I guess you're saying the, the new Energy Act we, we passed um, j just a few months ago right. enables them to use any kind of, of alternative fuel or alternative Ms. Norton, I would like to provide the details for the record, but as I understand it, uh, all the entire federal fleet, including the Postal Service, uh, has more flexibility under that act to look for the most fuel efficient vehicles that it can use rather than being required to purchase flex fuel vehicles. Well, thank you, Ms. <laughs> Wood. Just an obvious thing you can do <laughs> without having to do a whole lot. Uh, it certainly would be to, uh, I, have, I have great problems with ethanol <laughs> when mm -hmm. you consider what's happening to the price of grain. Understand where that comes from because yes. there are parts of the country for which that, that is important. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I think uh, I would appreciate your providing us, and, and if you would provide me as well, with this information. Absolutely. Um, as an obvious way to cut costs, and that we, we are assured will, be, will continue to rise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh,
confirmed as a commissioner of the former Postal Rate Commission on December the 9th, 2006 by the United States Senate and designated chairman by President George W. Bush on December the 15th, 2006. Gentlemen, as you know, it is the custom and tradition to swear witnesses in, so if you would stand and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Gentlemen, we thank you all so much for being here, and uh, of course it is indeed a pleasure to see you, Mr. Bilbray, again, and welcome. Uh, all of your record of your statements are included in the record, and if you would take five minutes and summarize your statements, we would appreciate that, and we'll begin with you, Mr. Postmaster General, Mr. Potter. Thank you, Chairman Davis, and good afternoon. I'm pleased to report to you today on the Postal Service's first year of operation under the Postal Act of 2006. The new law creates welcome pricing flexibilities that can and will benefit the nation by, be by keeping mail a welcome, efficient, and effective method to link every household and every business in America. And a financially healthy mailing industry based on a financially sound postal service supports local, regional, and national economies. But with a growing network that reaches 148 million homes and businesses every day, the mail business is extremely sensitive to fluctuations in the economy and to changes in the consumer preference of hard copy or electronic communication. The new law, for all its benefits, does not exempt the Postal Service from these facts. Compounding the diversion of some mail to the Internet, we have been hard hit by today's underperforming economy. The financial, credit, and housing sectors are key drivers of the mail business. The recessionary trend in these industries was quickly reflected in declines in mail volumes and revenues. By the end of the first quarter, mail volume was down 3% from a year earlier. First class mail fell by almost 1 billion pieces, or 4%. Standard mail fell by some 750 million pieces, 2.6%. Less mail volume means higher cost per piece of mail handled. Revenue was $525 million below plan, and net income fell short by $183 million. We see no improvements this quarter. Facing this extremely difficult situation, the men and women of the United States Postal Service have stepped up. They brought down spending, narrowing the huge revenue gap created by the sudden steep volume decline. Faced with a possible $2 billion shortfall this year, we're cutting an additional $1 billion in costs on top of the $1 billion that was already built into our plan, but not at the cost of service. Despite quarter one's challenges, our people deliver the strongest service in our history. On-time delivery of next-day first, cla uh, next first class mail reached 96%. Our two-day uh, mail rose to 93%, uh, uh, an all-time high, and our three-day matched our all-time high of 88%. We saw similar gains with remittance mail, payments to banks and credit card companies. Performance here is measured in hours, not days, and we cut two hours from payment processing and delivery between April and October, an all-time best. We have a lot going for us. For the first third straight time, we've been rated the most trusted government agency and one of the 10 most trusted organizations in the nation. Customer satisfaction remains high at 92%. Americans view the Postal Service more favorably than any other government agency, and they've done so for the past 10 years. Our brand is sound and our business is well positioned to rebound with the economy, but we cannot simply wait for a recovery. We must also pursue aggressive revenue growth. On May 12th, we're adjusting prices for our market-dominant products, first-class mail, standard mail, periodicals, and package services, under the law's new simplified pricing regulations, and conforming to, C to the CPI price cap. This can produce $735 million in additional revenue this year. To close the remaining gap, we're pursuing growth opportunities through a new and innovative price structure for our competitive products. We'll make these products more attractive, through incentives and enhanced features. We'll be announcing the new prices shortly for a May 12th implementation. 
Our people are ready. They understand the challenge. They're ready to take up every new tool the law has provided us. I'm particularly gratified by the support of our unions in this area. With their help, our employees are aggressively talking up and selling our products. They're making sure customers know how the mail can work for them. Every employee in the Postal Service understands that growth is necessary to produce the revenue and to support our mission of serving America, and every employee is part of that effort. Over the past year, other agencies and, mailing, and the mailing community have also been a part of the focused efforts to implement the requirements of the new law. Together, our progress has been significant. We've adjusted workers' compensation procedures. We reported on the issue of commercial practi best practices in our purchasing regulations. We revised our policies on handling data in connection with legal and judicial activities. The Office of the Inspector General reported on the progress of our employee safety program. We created a plan for implementation of international customs requirements throughout our system. We developed and submitted our initial mail classification schedule to the Postal Regulatory Commission. A, re a report by the Office of Inspector General examined an, our assessment and appeals process for nonprofit mailings. The Treasury Department submitted its recommendations on separate accounting for our market dominant and competitive products. The Government Accountability Office published an interim report on the Postal Service and mailing industry recycling. We submitted the initial version of our annual compliance report to the PRC. We've made steady progress in complying with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act requirements in the law, <coughs> including the first quarterly filing of our 10-Q report. A study by the Federal Trade Commission found that the Postal Service's status as a government agency provides us with a net competitive disadvantage versus private carriers. With the cooperation, feedback, and creative ideas of every part of the mailing industry, we created modern service standards for our market-dominant products. I appreciate their help. With their input and in cons consultation with the Postal Regulatory Commission, we've also begun work on new service measurement systems. Perhaps, and most importantly, the PRC issued its new price regulations well ahead of schedule. I want to thank Chairman Dan Blair, his fellow commissioners, and their staff for moving so quickly on this very, very important issue. All of these important tasks required community-wide cooperation, and I'm grateful for everyone's assistance. Beyond the specific requirements of the law, we're also changing how we speak about our business so it's clear to our customers. We no longer talk about rates. We talk about prices. We no longer talk about negotiated service agreements. We're talking about contract pricing. And we're referring to market-dominant products as mailing services and to competitive products as shipping services. We are entering a period of profound change. Through the new postal law, you have pro provided us with a new ability to navigate that change. As we begin this journey, I'm grateful for your continuing support of a sound and financially independent postal service that can serve our nation long into the future. I'll be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Potter. We will proceed to Mr. Gilbert. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Please don't confuse me with my crazy cousin, Brian, too. <laughs> he went bad somewhere along the line and became a Republican. <laughs> anyway, I, Chairman Davis, Ranking Member Marchant, he's not here, but members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. This is my first opportunity to testify, but he was a member of the board. I've only been on the first, my second, this is my second, beginning of my second year. I want you to know that I'm honored and pleased that my fellow governors have asked me to represent the board today, and I take this responsibility very seriously. I am fortunate to serve on a strong board with, a commi with committed members who have a wide range of experience in business and public and service. I am fortunate that we have an excellent leadership team. The record speaks for itself. Postal employees are providing record levels of service to the American public. Our employees and leadership team have risen to the occasion during a particularly challenging time. As we know, mail volumes have gone down and fluctuated, consumer habits and pricing is changing and weather conditions have plagued much of the country affecting mail service. Each of our labor contracts had to be renegotiated and were done successfully. Against this backdrop, the most significant change in our 35-year-plus history, the passage of the Postal Accountable Accountability and Enhancement Act of 2006. Last year, the Postal Service, the Postal Regulatory Commission, and a myriad of other stakeholders and mailers immediately went to work to implement the new laws provisions. Under the guidance of PRC Chairman Dan Blair and Postmaster General Jack Potter, 
we have tackled these, these challenges aggressively. And as a result, and in some cases ahead of schedule, timetables in the law have been met. Today, some 14 months later, we can collectively be proud of our progress. We are pleased to report to Congress to date we have detected no need for changes in the new law, and so far parties have the tools necessary to implement the law as Congress intended. I'd like to recognize the PRC for its hard work in enabling this to happen. The Postal Act of 2006 changed 35 years of history by creating a new pricing model. The governors had the option to file one last rate case under the regulations used since 1971. However, under Dan Blair's leadership, the PRC accelerated the finally finalizing their pricing rules, which allowed the governors to choose to move forward under the new pricing rules. This was an important vote of confidence in the new system. Across the spectrum, the Postal Service is working to deliver for the future. We are engaged in a broad effort to implement the wide-ranging requirements of the new law and to have spent much of the first year meeting with the PRC, our federal agency, unions, and mailers. Congress requested two updates from the board on different aspects of diversity within the, within the postal system. The first dealt with the extent that women and minorities are represented in supervisory and management positions. The second centered upon the number and value of contracts and some contracts the postal, ha postal service has with women, minorities, and small businesses. The Postal Service remains one of the leading employers of women and minorities. Representation in both groups has continued to increase. Consider that last year, minorities represented 38% of the workforce in the USPS. The Board is equally proud of the Postal Service's commitment to building strong relationships with small minority-owned and woman-owned businesses. The Board recognizes the Postal Service work is never done in this area. We are a dynamic, changing society with changing demographics. The Postal Service is, 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 is competing with both federal agencies and private workplaces for the best and brightest talent. But we have strategies in place to counter this. We have formed a talent and acquisition group, and they're recruiting on our college campuses and military bases. Last year, the Postal Service issued a new supplier diversity corporate plan. The plan focuses on continuous improvement in our business relationships with small, minority-owned, and women-owned businesses. We remain committed to a competitive supplier base. The post office mission to provide universal service was reaffirmed by the new postal law. Our mission is still to provide every American in our community with universal access and affordable, dependable mail service, even though we add nearly two million new addresses a year. To help support the universal service, the Postal Act allowed greater price flexibility for shipping services. We recognize the significance challenges posed by some of the fiercest competitive global companies in the realm. We are forging ahead to provide options to the American public. The Postal Service has set up a new express mail division and ground package unit to focus efforts on this market. As Governor set the strategic direction of the Postal Service, we are continuing to seek improvement and providing value to the American public. Organizing, communicating to 685,000 employees in a new way of thinking. A new way of doing business is no small task. Congress understood the challenges brought about by the changes in the marketplace and technology, and now Postal Service employees are delivering. Much of the new law's first years was devoted to setting up a future systems and processes. We have begun the next phase, implementation. Much more critical de deadlines are fast upon us for this year, but 2007 and 2008 thus far have been good, productive years. We have learned much, forged new partnerships, and had interesting debates and discussions. On behalf of the board, I'd like to again thank you and acknowledge Postmaster General Potter and PRC Chairman Dan Blade and our stakeholders have worked tirelessly to ensure the groundwork to delay position to position the Postal Service well for the years to come. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. And Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Gilbray. And Blair, with your indulgence, we're going to alter our procedure just a bit. Um, Chairman Waxman is under some tremendous time constraints but has some questions that he'd like to ask and I'd like to yield to him for the questions and then we'll return to our normal procedure. I love that title, Chairman Waxman. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me uh, ask my questions and forgive me for interrupting the testimony of the panel. Uh, we had some hearings of, in our committee about charities that are supposedly helping the veterans. And uh, these groups raise money 
to assist U.S. military personnel and veterans, but a number of these veterans groups spend far more on executive salaries and fundraising than they spend on delivering actual goods and services to the veterans. For example, uh, we had a testimony from one of the fathers of a veteran who uh, was wounded in the Iraq war, and he was struggling. The father ended up giving up his job just to try to take care of the follow-up medical services for his son. And when he heard about these so-called veterans charities that raised money and pocketed most of it and used a little bit for the helping of the veterans, he said, my son, as well as the other thousand of injured soldiers from this war or any other war, are not commodities. I don't think it's right that you can use these soldiers as commodities to raise funds and then turn around and give a small percentage of that to what you're saying that you're going to do with the contributions, end quote. Since that hearing, my staff has uh, uh, been talking to charity experts and regulators to understand how these groups can, can get away with this sort of thing. And we've heard that one important factor is the lack of disclosure and awareness by donors about how charities are spending their money. There's a man by the name of Roger Chapin. He's the head of Help Hospitalize Veterans and Coalition to Salute America's Heroes, two of the veterans charities that appear to be abusing their nonprofit status. His testimony at our hearing was quite revealing. He said, if we disclose, uh, which I'm more than happy to do, we'll all be out of business and the charities will out of be out of business and nobody would donate and it would all dry up. This is his words to justify the very small amount of money that actually got to the veterans. And he, by the way, was making a very nice income on all of this. Well, that's uh, one, the disclosure is one of the problems, but another appears to be an exception to the cooperative mail rule. Under this rule, which Mr. Potter instituted in 2003, for-profit fundraisers are able to use the nonprofit mailing rate so long as they share a small part of the proceeds with a nonprofit organization. My concern is that this rule allows unscrupulous fundraisers to <coughs> negotiate contracts that enrich the for-profit companies and take away funds from the intended beneficiaries. Mr. Potter, we've been talking to the National Association of State Charity Officials and other charity experts, and they're telling us that this cooperative mail rule is being abused. They describe situations where the for-profit direct mailer keeps both 80% of the proceeds and a list of the donors. They told us that these arrangements are abusive because the nonprofit get so little of the money, yet at the same time becomes dependent on the mailer because of the mailer's control, control of the donor list. I have two questions for you, Mr. Potter. Are you concerned about the abuse that appears to be occurring, and to what steps are you going to take to uh, address these issues? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I am concerned about the abuses. Uh, when we uh, instituted that rule in 2003, uh, the motivation was to try and help charities uh, because there were many charities who did not have the funds to put up for uh, the mailing campaigns that they had. And so it was a matter of, of having others take risk. And that was the motivation was well, to help yeah, charities. And, and obviously, was well obvi obviously it's backfired in some, in some yeah. cases. So we are exploring and we have been, been uh, monitoring uh, uh, the hearings that you've had, Good. we're very concerned with uh, some of the uh, abuses that, that you, through your hearings, have identified, and we're exploring ways of changing that rule such that we can make the, the American public more aware of, uh, you know, the actual, uh, through our regulations, through the actual charity, the actual amount of funds that ends up in those who they were intended for. Uh, and we're continuing to try and figure out how to oh, do I that at the same time. I appreciate that. I'm going to cut you short because I see my, my yellow light. Sure. And now that I'm not chairing the hearing, I could be okay. banged out of order <laughs> when my time is up. So uh, even though if the chairman's not looking, uh, the light is red, I wanted to address the same question to Mr. Blair because he's the head of the Postal Regulatory Commission. And then in the 2006 legislation, I insisted on a provision that that gave the PRC the authority to examine abuses of the nonprofit rate 
make recommendations to the Postal Service and act on its own initiative if the Postal Service didn't respond. Um, w we want the post office to uh, Postal Service to thrive. We know that uh, they're facing difficult challenges, but it's not acceptable for the Postal Service to encourage these deceptive mailings simply because they may generate more volume for the Postal Service. And this is a problem that I think ought to be addressed, and I'd like to ask you the same two questions. Are you concerned about the abuse that appears to be occurring, and what steps would you be willing to take to address these issues? Well, I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you bringing this There's before a us. Button is, the, on the base is the mic on? It's on. It's on. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, now. Okay. I appreciate you raising this with us. This is an issue of first impression with us. I'm not aware of the former rate commission or the regulator at this point uh, undertaking these types of investigations. If you'd like to certainly learn more about this, you reference a section in the new law that's something that we certainly would look at and we'll be happy to work with you. Uh, on first impression, I look at this and I, I see this as the inspector general's uh, primary role as well. We work quite closely with the IG's office of the Postal Service. Uh, while we look at the data and we look at the rates, um, any revenue protection and law enforcement seem to be their primary purview, but we're happy to work with you and your staff to see what we can do in this regard. I thank you very much. I, I think it's an important issue. I want to bring it to, to both of your attentions, and perhaps the IG ought to be involved as well, but I, I'd like you to review it because I think it's being abused. Thank you for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I regret that I have to leave to go to uh, California. Not that I regret going to California. It's always a wonderful place to go, but I, but I have to leave. Thank you very much. If it was any place else, we wouldn't miss it. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Blair. And uh, we can now uh, proceed to, to your opening statement. You saved the best for last, right, Mr. Chairman? That's right. Mr. Waxman, uh, Mr. Davis, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to present you with an update of the activities of the Postal Regulatory Commission. I'm pleased to be here with Postmaster General Potter and Governor Bill Bray, and I appreciate their kind words about the Commission as well. My written testimony gives a complete agenda of our activities, but I'm pleased to summarize my statement. It's been a very busy year for us at the Commission. Standing up the regulatory framework eight months ahead of schedule, consulting with the Postal Service on the development of modern service standards, completing one last final rate case under the old regu regulatory regime, topped the list of those activities. It was a fulfilling year, but we can't rest on our accomplishments since this upcoming year presents equal, if not greater, challenges. Our agenda includes further consultation on service standard goals and performance measurement systems. I want to compliment the most Postmaster General and his team at the USPS headed up by Deputy PMG Pat Donahue for their work with us on the development of the service standards and our continuing consultation. The PRC's efforts in this area added value and I'm pleased that many of our suggestions over the past few months were incorporated in the final performance standards. Our monthly meetings have proved to be a good conduit for consultations and communication in other issues which arise from time to time. This open and ongoing dialogue helps makes our system work better and I look forward to continuing this practice. Currently, we are undertaking two new Postal Accountability Enhancement Act reviews. First, we are reviewing the data provided by the Postal Service as part of its annual compliance report. And we are reviewing the rate adjustment filing under our new regulatory framework submitted by the Postal Service on February 11th. With the experience gained in the review of the first annual data submission by the service, we will shortly propose rules to tighten up the process. The review of the first annual report has identified areas where data collection, special studies, and cost model models can be updated. We are also beginning work on the Universal Service Obligation Study, which was mandated by the PAEA. We plan to solicit views from the Postal Service, other federal agencies, the postal community, and the general public on their expectations of universal postal service. Given the scope of this study, we're supporting our commission work through a competitively awarded contract with George Mason University School of Public Policy. Your first witness today, Professor Wallach, will be among those providing assistance to the Commission as part of GMU's work for us. We expect to engage in broad public outreach as well as conduct several field hearings to gauge the mailing public's needs and perceptions in this area. We plan a very comprehensive and well-documented report. As I mentioned in my statement, we believe our congressionally mandated report will have the benefit of the findings and recommendations of the separate report 
being prepared by the Postal Service through the National Academy of Science. I want to thank Postmaster General Potter for his assistance in this effort. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, those are several of our front burner issues. An additional priority is to see the successful nomination of a new commissioner to fill our one vacant seat. I'm pleased to report that yesterday, President Bush nominated Nancy Langley to fill that seat. Many of you may know Nancy from her longtime work for Senator Akaka on the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. She's currently the Commission's Director of Public Affairs and Government Relations. I'm sure you will join my fellow commissioners and me in wishing her a speedy confirmation. My written testament goes into further detail, and I'm pleased to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Blair, and I want to thank all three of our witnesses for your indulgence and for being here with us this afternoon. Um, Mr. Potter, let me ask you, could you give us a status report on the financial results in the second quarter to date and indicate whether or not the economic downturn that we've heard so much about uh, has continued to affect postal revenues? Mr. Chairman, as I said in my opening statement, that uh, our revenues after the first quarter were down some $525 million. After the first two months of the uh, second quarter, they're down another $400 million. So uh, the uh, economy continues to uh, hurt the Postal Service's revenues. Um, also, um, last year, um, the Postal Service issued a request information related to outsourcing the mail processing activities conducted in its bulk mail centers. Could you tell us the status of this proposal and whether or not it involves outsourcing a core postal function? Uh, we uh, received that, re got the information on that, through that request for information. Uh, we've analyzed that information. We've shared it with our unions. We're working with the uh, American Postal Working Union and the uh, Mail Handler Union. We intend to go out with a request for proposal. Uh, as again, we're doing in it in consultation with them, very close consultation with them. That's where we're at right now. And I also know that the Postal Service, and we were pleased to see the Postal Service and the National Association of Letter Carriers reach uh, some agreement, and the agreement ended up being a six-month moratorium on any efforts to contract out the delivery of city or suburban routes. The moratorium ends uh, next month. Um, what do we see happening if, if at this point? Well, part of that agreement was that we would enter into a period of dialogue with the NALC. Uh, we got off to a, a slow start. It's become productive, and we've extended that moratorium through uh, the end of July. And, uh, and so the and there will be continuous discussions, I would. We're, we're doing it because the, the, the discussions have been productive. Uh, and I said we, we got off to a late start, so we didn't want to uh, curtail them, and we're hoping that uh, we're able to uh, work thing th that issue through and reach uh, an amicable agreement on it. And let me be just a little bit uh, self-serving. Uh, you did uh, mention in your testimony record uh, service performances for first-class mail. Um, what has been the uh, experience in the Chicago area? Well, Mr. Chairman, as you uh, know all too well, we had service problems in Chicago for the last couple of years, and I'm very proud of all the folks in Chicago who have really stepped up their efforts to improve service, and we've seen a great improvement in, in uh, overall service in the city of Chicago. Uh, we, uh, it's through the efforts of, as I said, everyone who works there, they've, uh, worked hard to uh, improve the, the quality of, of addresses that we have in Chicago, uh, our address database. Uh, we have upgraded all of our machines. We're in the process of upgrading our facilities, and we've uh, uh, 
realigned our staffing and so i think you can uh, count on the fact that the service uh, will continue to get better there would the activities that took place um, be perceived perhaps as a model or an approach that might be used in other areas that might be experienced and are having the same problem? I, I think the approach is uh, one that could be replicated in other places uh, where uh, similar problems hopefully aren't exist today, but if, if they were to happen, we could replicate that, that effort in Chicago and other locations. Thank you very much. Mr. Bilbray, let me ask you, uh, has the Board of Governors role changed in your perception since the um, postal reform law was enacted? M Mr. Chairman, it, it has in the sense that, again, I was only a member of the Board for a short period before the, the change took place. But in talking to other members that were there before and also the few months that I was there before, our load has really increased. Uh, I think it's because we have the, we have the Sarbanes-Oxley provisions going forward. We have uh, the audit committee is meeting all the time. I mean, they meet uh, where they used to meet maybe for three or four hours on, on about every fourth week. They're meeting when they do meet two or three days. Uh, it's, 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 uh, we're on the phone constantly, not only with the meetings that we personally come to, but telephonic meetings. Uh, virtually everything that is done is, is, is go with the goal of transparency. Uh, it, I know we have, uh, we don't have, they don't have to call us on levels that are spending below certain amounts, but the fact is it seems like with the cost of everything going up and even the cost of our construction, I mean, we've had to pull back on construction because construction costs are shooting out of sight and our bids are coming uh, in at 30, 25, 30 percent higher than we estimated. So the board's, the board's really active. I, when I was asked to serve by Senator Reid on this board and uh, went through the process, nobody told me that it would be a full-time position for a, and a part-time position, but it virtually is. I, I spend two to three hours a day going through documents sent to me from the, uh, from the Postmaster General in his office. Uh, it is, a, uh, it is quite, a, quite a job. And uh, just to remember something, uh, I'd like to point out that $300 we get paid per meeting was set in 1970. <laughs> hint, hint. Well, maybe <laughs> Senator Reid just didn't want you to get too comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that. Well, let me ask you, in your testimony, you also um, put emphasis on um, the role of, of minorities <coughs> and women, especially as it relates to small business and small business development and activities. The board was required under the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act to conduct a study on the representation of women and minority members in supervisory and management positions. Would you reemphasize for us the findings uh, to date of that study? Uh, the, the, Mr. Chairman, the findings are out. The recommendations are not. And what I was told by staff before I came here is that they were finalizing that and that would be made available to the committee and to yourself as soon as, as we, but, but we have increased. They say that the, the numbers were not, in fact, I asked for, I said, can you give me the total percent just like they did with 38% of our, of our postal employees are minorities or women? Uh, I asked for the number, the total number, and they said it's not broken down that way. It's broken down into a percent here, a percent there, something here. And I said, well, that's not satisfactory. So they said they would get that information for me uh, as soon as possible, and they would forward it to you and the committee to see. But it, there has been a drastic improvement, and we are moving forward on that. So we have, we'll have those numbers to you in a very short time. Well, thank you very much. Let me ask you, Mr. Blair, um, what criteria will the uh, regulatory commission use for evaluating the quality completeness and accuracy of rate-making data? We have uh, approximately 36 years of rate-making uh, experience in this regard, and we'll use uh, sampling techniques. We look at the statistics. We'll also apply special studies uh, of operations using calculating certain discounts that are recommended by the Postal Service. Uh, 
Many of the problem areas will be identified through the annual, re through the annual data submissions by the Postal Service. We're currently in the annual compliance review process. Uh, we've asked the Postal Service for certain information, clarifications and updates of certain information, and we've, we're receiving that as we speak. We're also in an annual, in a, uh, uh, not an annual, but a, a rate review period as well, in which we've asked for additional data. And so for, as time goes on, we'll develop more and better ways of getting this, but there are certainly areas where studies need to be updated. For instance, uh, city carrier street time studies can be updated. Um, the read and acceptance rates can be updated. And also, as the Postal Service implements the new flat sequencing system and employs those sorters, we'll need, need, we will need new sortation cost studies. So this is going to be an ongoing area. I can't emphasize enough, though, how important it is that we have good quality data. And that's something that the Commission has long, um, long held that the quality, data that we, the quality of the data that we get from the Postal Service is, is extremely important because it goes into costing methodologi methodologies that were employed in the old rate making process. Now it goes into the methodologies that are employed in the compliance process. So we're going to remain vigilant and constantly uh, monitor the quality of the data that comes out. Now let me ask you, um, as part of its reorganization, we understand that PRC has abolished the Office of Consumer Advocate. Could you tell us how you expect now to make sure that consumer interests and concerns, um, you know, remain prominent in the process of, of, of the rate making that will take place? Uh, we're taking a two-pronged approach on this. Uh, we have reorganized to reflect our new, uh, to reflect the new inf reform environment brought about enactment by the enactment of the uh, Postal Accountability Enhancement Act. First, we're mindful that the new law requires the appointment of a public representative in proceedings before the Commission. That's a very important public role. And what we're doing with that is that um, under the old structure, under the Postal Reform Act uh, that the Commission developed, um, we had a standing office and that was designed to litigate omnibus cases over a 10 month uh, long case period. The PAEA changed that paradigm. We expect now a shorter, more limited and more focused dockets and significantly fewer major litigated cases. In order to best utilize the resources before the Commission, what we will do is appoint a public representative from among our Commission staff offices. That allows us to better pinpoint and target um, the type of uh, expertise we need to, do, to engage in that public, uh, public representation. We think this will be a, a better and more effective way than the old structure we've allowed in this new environment. We've also, take, we've also developed a uh, new, we've also implemented a new Office of Public Affairs and Government Relations. And one of the re primary responsibilities of this new office is to interact with the public, field questions, and resolve, uh, help resolve informal inquiries regarding the Postal Service. Uh, in addition, the Commission will be coming forward uh, in a f in, uh, over the next few months with new complaint procedures to supplement the current ones that we have in place. And those will be subject to public notice and comment. Not that you would have any kind of crystal ball. But given all of the discussion relative to the economy, downturns, um, new ways of doing business, e-commerce, um, what would you sort of see as a, a super major challenge of the Postal Service in order to try and keep rates uh, at a level that consumers uh, will be most appreciative of? I think there, there are several, several fronts that they will be needing to focus on. One will be in order to keep their labor costs in line. Two, better rationalize their networks. I was listening to the GAO uh, testimony in the ante room, and the GAO, Keith Sigurd, provided a good uh, outlook saying that they, there were some plants are at overcapacity, some are at undercapacity, and a better rationalization of that network is important. Good data is needed to rationalize that network. 
but I think that the Postal Service needs, and I know that the Postmaster General is committed to doing more in order to cut costs and better uh, utilize that network. I think more needs, to, more innovative ways need to uh, be developed in which we keep mailers in the system, be it first class mailers who are the ones, uh, the business mailers, the banks, the insurance companies, those major mailers <coughs> who utilize first class, the flagship product of the Postal Service, uh, keeping them in the system, what can be done to give added value to that mail, to standard mail, and also the Postmaster General referenced uh, maybe new some, some new competitive products. The regulator wants to create a, an environment which is flexible yet transparent, and it's going to be a balancing act. And it's, not an, it's not an easy balancing act either, but we want to make sure that there's flexibility there, yet there is the requisite accountability and transparency to the postal pricing and operations that the public demands and deserves. Thank you very much. And uh, let me go to uh, Delegate Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Potter, you, you say at page uh, five of your reserve testimony um, that um, you've identified savings of an additional $1 billion over the $1 billion already built into the savings budget. Where would those savings come from? Uh, they'll come from a no number of things. First, there'll be there's less mail anticipated. Uh, and so if there's- How's that savings? <laughs> it sounds to me like loss of business. Well, there's loss of business, but in terms of the budgets that we gave work hours, if there's less mail, then there is, there's less work hours needed. So in terms of a reduction off of the plan, the plan will be reduced to reflect the lighter workload. In addition to that, uh, we're- uh, Although, Mr. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure private business would recall those savings, but I'll take it, Mr. Potter. Okay. In addition to that, <laughs> we're uh, reducing uh, and streamlining our transportation network uh, because we're uh, looking at uh, uh, all of the nodes on our network and revising the uh, number of trips and the size of the trucks, which are all contracted, uh, to determine whether or not uh, they're actually needed and whether or not we can streamline the number of trucks. We're about to, uh, this week, we've been counting our uh, rural carrier routes as part of our contract. Uh, it's going to reflect the fact that there's been a decline in volume on each of those routes uh, since uh, they've been last counted two years ago. And so that will re result in a uh, reduction uh, in terms of uh, the amount of, uh, uh, of compensation that those folks are given. In addition to that, uh, we're looking at the productivity of each and every operation. and. Uh, we're working to improve our efficiency in those operations. So it's basically very hard work to try and, and do it's things better. It's very hard work. It's very hard work. Um, um, you are you are very um, fuel and car and truck oriented. Um, you may have heard me a a ask the previous uh, witness about conversion to alternative vehicles. Are you still using uh, vehicles that largely rely on on traditional fuel? Y yes, we are. Are you doing that even as uh, you have to replace vehicles, as you must have to do quite often? Uh, no, we're not. We, uh, we have the largest alternate fuel fleet of vehicles in America. Uh, are and those so biofuels and ethanol? Yes. But in addition, to, in, in addition to that, we have uh, 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 p gas powered vehicles. Uh, we have hydrogen vehicles. Uh, we're looking at everything that we possibly can, and we're testing them all. Yeah, well um, there was some. There was some. We some just feeling that, that that you were constrained in what kind of alternative vehicle you could use. Are you constrained at all in that way? any longer after the new energy bill was passed nope. last year? No, we're not. In fact, uh, we're now looking, we delayed the replacement of uh, engines and or the vehicles of some 150,000 vehicles uh, in anticipation that we would have greater flexibility should that law pass. That law has passed. We now have the greater flexibility. So we're, we're once again looking at uh, what we do with the existing fleet, and we know we have an opportunity to improve. What's the turnover? How, uh, do you, how many vehicles do you buy a year? 
well in the last several years we've only bought about ten thousand we have about one hundred seven just don't have the money so you just kept rolling oh no we about fourteen years ago to seventeen years ago we bought a fleet of aluminum body vehicles we call it a long life vehicle and that vehicle is probably overdue for replacement about the last four years we should have replaced them but again we had this energy issue that we wanted to work our way through so you would you buy any traditional fuel vehicles at this point if you had to buy one tomorrow would you would you be looking exclusively at some kind of alternative fuel vehicle not necessarily exclusively because we buy a myriad of vehicles from very large trucks to so you mean sometimes with very large vehicles you must use we would use traditional diesel we don't have alternatives there I'm just trying to be all right where there are alternatives where there are alternatives we attempt to buy alternative fuel vehicles again we look at feel you are under any pressure to buy biofuels as opposed to for example some of the other not now all right um let me that's very important it is and i thank the congress for helping us with that law it's extremely important and you've really increased our flexibility and we're very appreciative of it and as i said we uh delayed a decision until we determine whether or not we would be able to it, and we're very grateful for the flexibility we have. Very got. smart. I mean, there, there's not many things you can do, but to continue to to spend money as you you did in the good old days, or whatever we now want to call them. I, I was interested in page seven of your testimony, um, where you talk about express mail and priority mail. I, I just have to congratulate you for what you report that you have penetrated, gone beyond. Um, express mail and priority mail in some respects you say express mail offers Saturday delivery at regular weekday delivery price that that must match the competition I take it because you go on to say in the Postal Service alone is offering Sunday and holiday liver delivery at this guaranteed overnight delivery price if, if I could explain, um, with, the, with the new law, we've gone back and we now have pricing flexibility. So we're looking at ourselves in the marketplace to determine what prices we could charge. And we're looking to try and charge market-based prices for the competitive products. We found that we're the only ones who sell Sunday delivery. And so we want to make it clear to all Americans that if you want delivery of express mail on Sunday, you want to be able to walk into a lobby and buy it. You place to do it is with us. Can I just ask Mr. Potter, how long have you been doing the Sunday mail? We've delivery? been doing it a long time, but w but the profit on Sunday mail has been low. Uh, because is that why your competitors aren't rushing to get into the Sunday mail? No, I think that the competition? reason. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. they're not open 24 hours a day like we are with our with all of our plants from around the country. So they have much different operations, much more defined operations than you we do. You mean they're not o on a retail basis, they're not open? They're not open on Saturday on a retail basis in a lot of cases, but they don't have 24-hour operations 365 days a year necessarily, uh, particularly with express mail. In our case, we do, and so since we have that infrastructure, we, we try to maximize our, our uh, opportunity for revenue off of that infrastructure. So what we're doing with the new law is we're, we're, we're going to put a surcharge on Sunday delivery because we have people who come in and buy a product on Saturday and they'll request Sunday delivery because it's free. We're the only ones that don't surcharge Saturday delivery. And so since that's a normal day of operation, we're not looking to surcharge Saturday. But since Sunday is an unusual day for us, our carriers aren't out there anyway, we, we're going to surcharge that. and. We're going to do as any marketplace uh, or private competitor would do. You charge what the market will bear. And we believe that if mm -hmm. the competition charges, uh, puts a surcharge or a premium on Saturday delivery, the least we should do as a start is put it on Sunday. So we're looking forward to you know, additional revenues from those pieces who deliver on Sunday. For those people who don't require Sunday delivery, they'll get their mail delivered on Monday, which they would have done you know, with others. And we're the only ones, as I said, who, who really have an operation on Saturday. And since you got it, Matt, so you've got a volume here that nobody had before, volume of business that nobody had before. Well, we have an opportunity to increase the revenue on the business that we had. Do you lose any money had. on this? Do you lose any money on this business? 
No, we, we, we weren't losing money, but we were not making it. It cost us $5.50 more to deliver a piece of mail, an express mail piece on Sunday than it does the rest of the week. So that cuts into our profits on Sunday. Okay. And so I think just by raising the price, we're going to increase the awareness of the fact that we're doing it. The fact that we didn't have a high profit on Sunday was a motivation not to really be aggressive mm -hmm. about selling it. Now that we can sell it and make a profit, a, re a sizable profit, we're going to be out there in the marketplace and sell it. So we're taking advantage of the new law that you provided. Now that you've got the uh, infrastructure and the overhead anyway, um, maximizing that is, is, I don't know if you can think of anything else to do with it, but it's terrific. Thank you. <laughs> uh, finally, let me ask you about the flat rate boxes. I'm <laughs> you seem to imply, by the way, because you talk about scratching the surface, you just scratch the surface. So I'm going to ask. I'm going I'm to have a question. What kind? Of, uh, what other kinds of terrific things can you do to keep scratching? But you talk about uh, the new larger priority mail flat rate boxes. That was res a response to competition that is already doing that. No, we were the we were the first to have a flat rate box for priority mail, uh, and it was a smaller box. It was extremely popular. We've had a lot of growth in, in terms of that product. And the competition, one of our competitors matched that and put out a box that's a comparable size. And so we recognize that that flat rate box is attractive to customers because you pay one price, whatever fits, it works. And so we wanted to give the American public another option, and that's why we went with the larger flat rate box, and we appreciate the fact that the Postal Regulatory Commission uh, has approved that, that option, mm -hmm. and it begins on March 3rd. And we're you all were excited into about their it. their market, they felt the competition. And so you, you upped them because you're now doing a bigger box. Well, we have a bigger box, and that bigger box also has, it, we tried to respond to uh, a concern uh, of uh, those folks and the families of the folks that we have serving overseas mm -hmm. in our military, and we have a uh, discount on that box for military addresses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, does the competition uh, do that too? No, no, and we're a we're very happy and pleased that we're able to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, you're going to do uh, flat boxes on Saturday and Sunday since they can't work at all, <laughs> since they don't do anything on Saturday. Well, we're hoping to. I'll be honest with you. With the downturn in, in revenue and the concern about diversion to the internet, you know, we're working very closely with all of our employees, our unions, uh, and others to try and, and generate revenue to support this very vital system that, that serves each and every American six days a week. And uh, I'm really happy with the level of support that, that uh, everyone has shown, the, the Postal Regulatory Commission, but in particular our employees who are out there and who are going to uh, help spread the word about the fact that uh, they now have the ability to compete and they're anxious to compete and they're anxious to, uh, to grow revenue. Well, my final question really is relate related to this question because uh, I can guarantee you now they're sitting down right now thinking of a way uh, to, um, to um, take away your Saturday and Sunday business with no, uh, which depends on your infrastructure, depends on your 24-hour service with no extra cost to them depend on it. But, but and if they find a way, they're going to find a way through investment in some kind of equipment. Most of the, the, the advances in productivity we see around the world come, come that way. <laughs> what about your capacity? Leave aside the investment that is taking away mail from you or communication vehicle from you. What about your capacity to invest in the kind of equipment needed uh, to move forward to keep up with whatever the competition is doing, especially in these sectors like express mail and the rest? Well, fortunately for us, the, the, uh, we have existing capacity, particularly in the delivery area because we're at every door every day. Um, when it comes to plant capacity, the law provides that we have the opportunity to borrow and invest. So we, it's, it's up to the Board of Governors and, and Postal Management to uh, use that authority to invest wisely in the capacity that you described. Are you keeping up with uh, the kinds of uh, investments 
Uh, the delayed gratitude of the private sector is very interesting when it comes to these types of investments because they know the payout. They call it all kinds of flexibility to put it on different lines and stuff, stuff that you can't do. Do you feel that you are keeping up uh, with this modern uh, technological equipment that the private sector is using uh, uh, and you're, you're able to do so through the authority you have to borrow? Well, l let me speak of it in two ways. When it comes to mail, whether the sortation of letter mail and flat mail, so first class mail and advertising mail, the Postal Service, United States Postal Service, has the best equipment in the world. We are world class, bar none, because we've had the, the scale and the scope of our delivery. And of course, that's where you're losing money. And, and that's where, th unfortunately, that's where uh, mail will be diverted or potentially diverted. Yes. On the other hand, when it comes to package service, I'll tell you and be very honest with you that we uh, were not and have not been investing as aggressively on the mail side only because of the fact that we didn't have the ability to compete. So if you don't have the ability to compete, it, you know, you weren't going to make investments. Now that th the new law is in place and now that we have the ability to, to set a plan and know where we're going to be longer term, we're reevaluating that and we do have the funds available to us within our, our borrowing limits. We borrow from the Treasury. We have the capital program. I'm, I'm convinced that we have sufficient funds to make the type of investment that will be needed to compete. Are we, where th are we where they are? No, we're behind. But we can, through proper investment, we can, we can catch up and catch up rather quickly. Borrowing from the Treasury is a great advantage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Delegate Norton. Uh, let me just, uh, Mr. Potter, you, you've mentioned um, cost cutting um, increased efficiency. Um, in the way of cost cutting ideas, um, what can we expect to hear about? Well, I, I think that uh, I, I'll give you examples of some of the things that we're doing on the competitive side of the aisle. Uh, one of the things that we're doing there is, is just beginning to put uh, the databases in so that we're tracking productivities by different operations. There's still some areas where we don't have good information systems and simply by tracking them we'll give uh, people, and I'm talking about the, our, our craft employees as well as managers, you know, information about how well they're doing and that often is a, is a big motivation. In addition to that, uh, we do have some redundancies in the system and, and we're looking at minimizing the number of handlings that we have uh, in a system. We're looking at error rates on machines, uh, and we've made some good strides in improving the error rates on our machines. We're also looking at the quality of mail that's produced by the mailing community to try and improve the quality of the mail, either b through the address and or the physical piece itself. And by improving that quality, we reduce the number of ha rehandlings that occur in the system. And so uh, to me, it's a matter of just tightening up on our processes making sure that people have the data that they need to manage and understand how well they're performing. And uh, it will drive, uh, in my opinion, it will continue to drive the efficiency of the Postal Service. Are we likely to continue to hear uh, much about uh, outsourcing, uh, contracting out? Uh well, you won't hear about it from me, but there are others who might comment. <laughs> 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 uh, but, but in all, in all candor, we do, we do have ongoing dialogue with the NALC and rurals are participating on that panel. Um, and as I said, we've extended the moratorium until uh, July 31st. In addition to that, uh, you, you referenced earlier the discussion about the uh, request for information that we put on out about our network. And we're engaged with the mail handlers and the American Postal Workers Union on discussing what options we have. You know, there are some very real business decisions that have to be made. And the discussion, I'll just share this with you. When we look at our end-to-end -end network on the ground uh, nationwide, we don't have a big demand for that service. In fact, the, the volume of mail that moves end-to-end, -end, parcel post on the ground, is in a state of decline. That's a product that has a rate cap on it. If the volume declines and, and we're forced to maintain the current network, 
we don't see how we're going to be able to stay under a rate cap. If, and if that system's inefficient, I'll be honest with you, it won't be very long before it'll be cheaper to fly the mail, which means it'll be a high cost product and no one will use it. So it, it, there's a, some very serious business uh, issues and we're sharing those in a very candid way with our employees to try and figure out how we're going to be successful under the new law and meet the requirements of the new law to stay under the rate of inflation and at the same time have a viable product. And so, uh, you know, we are a challenged business in the sense that every one of our products is competing and uh, in some cases there are cheaper alternatives than the postal service and, you know, with the case of the internet, some people think more effective. I personally don't, but people believe they're more effective. So I think this is part of the overall kind of evolution of the Postal Service. When you think about us 200 years plus, there have been a lot of changes and we're at a period of time then again, I think we have to have the debate about what are we gonna evolve into next. Well, let me thank all of you and let me thank you for the information that you have shared with us. Obviously, I was very pleased to hear you talk about the improvements that we have experienced across the board and especially in some particular areas. And I just remind you that my mother used to tell us, good, better, and best, never let it rest until your good becomes better and your better becomes best. And so I guess we keep striving to make sure that we get there. And finally, as you talked about the um, cost cutting and savings and trying to figure that out and how to do it, I, you, you reminded me of my father who was a very frugal man, but then he would even get to the point where he would say, you know, you can't get blood out of a turnip. You can slice it, you can dice it, you can do everything with it, and you still end up with turnip juice. So I recognize the difficulties which our system face. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for being with us. Thank you all for coming, and this meeting is adjourned.